Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, most gracious, most merciful. Alhamdulillahi wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his entire household, all his companions. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them all and bless every single one of us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive our shortcomings, accept the few deeds that we have done, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us Jannah. Ameen. My beloved brothers and sisters, Surah An-Nur is a surah that is named after the light, An-Nur. And in this surah, there are many rules and regulations regarding morality. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens the surah by making mention of the sin of adultery and fornication. And thereafter, Allah makes mention of a sin that is even worse than that. And that is to accuse someone who is innocent of the sin of adultery or fornication. Verse number 23 of this particular surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of people who have committed a very grave crime. Those who have earned the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those who will be considered liars in not only in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but even for us, those who have accused someone else of committing immorality when they don't have the witnesses, they have not brought forth shari evidence that which is acceptable in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Four brilliant eyewitnesses to come forth and say, This is what happened. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Those are criminals. Those are people you should never believe anything they say. Not at all. Nothing. Even if they are telling you the truth in something else, you accept it because of the statement being made from someone else, but not from them. Imagine how bad that crime is. So Allah says they will then be known as liars. Listen to the verse. Number 23, Allah says, In fact, before that, verse number 4, right at the beginning, Allah says, those who accuse the innocent females, those who accuse the women who are chaste. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Then they don't come with four witnesses. If they've accused a woman and they don't come with four witnesses, then what happens? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَجْلِدُوهُمْ ثَمَانِينَ جَلْدَةً they need to be punished 80 lashes because they have come with a crime and obviously this is under an islamic court and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says don't ever accept from them any witness that they bear after that never once it is proven that they were liars and they had lied about somebody's honor and dignity then don't ever believe a story from them. Never. Allah says, وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْفَاسِقُونَ Those are the ones who are sinners to accuse people. So protect yourselves, my brothers and sisters, not only from sinning in a different way, but from this particular sin where a lot of us think it's light to accuse people. You know, these people are having an affair. Those people are like this. That one's had an illegitimate child. The other one, this, the other one, that. The morality, dignity and honor of a believer is very, very sacred. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding. So Allah says, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ تَابُوا مِن بَعْدِ ذَلِكَ وَأَصْلَحُوا There is an exception being made of those who have repented after that and they have made amends Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says definitely Allah is most forgiving most merciful may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us the previous verse I was speaking about verse number 23 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says indeed those who accuse of adultery or fornication or immorality those chaste believing women who are innocent of it Allah says they will be cursed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this world and the next and for them will be a great punishment may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us really the reason I make mention of this with so much of passion is because we say these statements sometimes considering it light 
simple. It's just gossip. And people just get a kick out of talking about others. Be careful, my brothers and sisters. The curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can overtake a person just by them spreading rumor about another person. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the accusation of our mother, Aisha radiallahu anha, the purest of the pure from amongst the women, whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has clarified her purity in the Quran. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about how people had created a tale about her. They accused her, A'udhu billah. I won't go into the story, but I want to draw from it the lessons. Allah says, verse number 11, those who have come with the false accusation of immorality against you from amongst you they are from amongst you don't think that it is bad for you it is in fact better for you wow how can it be better for us People are spreading accusations about us, about you, about me, about anyone else. How on earth can that be good for us? Allah says, don't worry. It's better for you. For as long as that is false, obviously, in our case, if it is the truth, you need to be worried. But if it is false, you need to know that that is the best thing that could have happened. Perhaps Allah is elevating your status. You will go through the patience and the forbearance. For the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the sabr that you will bear, Allah will reward you for it. Another thing, any good deeds that they have, you will be getting them for free. Allahu Akbar. You will be getting them for free. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will clarify your name and your status when he knows the time is correct. Sometimes that will only be in the hereafter. Imagine because you were patient, you were a clean person. People spread accusations about you of any sort, any nature. They hurt you, they harmed you, but you carried on for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Suddenly, because you were patient on the day of judgment, Allah calls you out and Allah says, for you is going to be a special place on this day. Imagine when others are to witness that and they are to wonder, what was the deed you did? I was just patient. People spread a lot of rumor about me, but I was patient. My brothers and sisters, this is a beautiful verse. It teaches us restraint and the beauty of practicing sabr. And the reward of it but my brothers and sisters the biggest lesson of all be careful not to spread rumor about others save yourselves from the punishment may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us and allah says regarding the categories of people who heard the rumors you know number one is the person who created the tale he is a criminal he is a disaster but secondly those who received the tale they fell into several categories one those who refused to even listen allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse number 16 there was a category of people and later Allah makes mention of this saying the believers should have when they heard the speech said immediately that no way we should not be uttering these words. We should not be spoiling our tongues with such words against fellow believers, especially Aisha radiallahu anha. Never ever mess your tongue by speaking derogatory about Aisha radiallahu anha in particular and the other companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam followed by the rest of the believers. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, true believers are those whose tongues are saved and protected from speaking evil about the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you hear someone bad mouthing the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wallahi, they can never ever call themselves true believers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us immediately the true believers should be saying, Subhanaka hadha buhtanun azim. You know, glory be to Allah, praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is indeed a fabrication. It is a slander against these people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and guide us. Imagine if we were to be speaking bad about the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, those who were chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be in his company, then what would happen to the rest of the deen? How did it get to us? It is those who want to cancel and delete Islam that make people believe that the companions were not good so that they can introduce into the deen that which was not there. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and forgive them. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. So my brothers and sisters, Allah says, 
Verse number 15. إِذْ تَلَقَّوْنَهُ بِأَلْسِنَتِكُمْ وَتَقُولُونَ بِأَفْوَاهِكُمْ مَا لَيْسَ لَكُمْ بِهِ عِلْمٍ وَتَحْسَبُونَهُ هَيِّنًا وَهُوَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ عَظِيمٌ That the news that was actually received and relayed by the tongues, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you have spoken with your mouths that which you do not have knowledge and you think it is something minor. You think it is a small matter, but in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is absolutely major. It is something very big. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. Sometimes we are facing destruction in our lives because we have forwarded a WhatsApp message, because we have liked a post on Facebook, because perhaps we have said something, because we have made an utterance, because perhaps we have spoken on the phone while we were laughing and joking, accusing an innocent person and your life is turned upside down. And you don't know why am I sick? Why am I struggling in business? Why, am, why is this going wrong in my family? Why is my marriage now in trouble? Why am I not happy? Why am I not content? It's because sometimes of one statement. Something you did, you accused someone, you spoke bad about someone. Be careful, save yourselves. A lot of us are suffering, struggling, and we are searching for the solutions of that particular struggle or those sufferings in a different direction altogether. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly tells us that these are the type of things that will actually destroy your life, this world and the next. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Listen to verse number 19. Those who love to spread tales of immorality or who love to spread immorality itself among the believing males and females for them will be a severe punishment in this world and the next. So safeguard your tongues, my brothers and sisters. It's not worth it. Not at all. Rather think best about others than to mess your tongue with that which is hurtful, untrue, incorrect, a slander, and it will result in our own downfall. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. So this is why Allah says those who love to spread tales of immorality. You see the term al-fahisha means immorality. When you spread immorality, people who encourage others to be immoral, you forwarded a pornographic clip to someone else on WhatsApp, for example, and you didn't realize that was forwarded to 24,000 people as a result. And you are busy sitting saying, Oh Allah, forgive me. People are enjoying the sin that you encourage them to watch. Astaghfirullah. And you are busy asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide you. And you haven't even thought that what you did was wrong. One of the conditions of seeking forgiveness is to admit your error. Allahu Akbar. We didn't think it was wrong. We just forwarded it. What was it? Come on. Don't you laugh sometimes? Can't you take a joke? A'udhu Billah. What type of a joke? If it's something sinful, you're not supposed to be joking about it. You don't joke about sinful matters, my brothers and sisters. I cannot send a nude image and claim that it's just a joke. I'm laughing. Laugh at it, please. No, it is bad. It is wrong. It can result in our downfall. Allah is saying when you spread immorality among believing males and females, dropping the level of morality between them, then you should know you are a person whom Allah has cursed. And Allah says you will, you will taste severe punishment in this world and the next. So therefore, my brothers and sisters, Let's become a little bit more careful about this. Let's seek Allah's forgiveness. Oh Allah, forgive us. And let's become a little bit more conscious about what we say, what we do, what we utter. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Thereafter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of seeking permission before you enter someone else's house. It's very interesting because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions these etiquettes in Surah An-Nur and in fact, they sometimes would be such that we wouldn't realize that Allah has given us the right to do certain things. So Allah says, O you who believe, when, do not enter houses that are not yours until you make yourself known to them and you seek permission to enter, to enter the house. Verse number 27 of Surah An-Nur, Allah says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا تَدْخُلُوا بُيُوتًا غَيْرَ بُيُوتِكُمْ حَتَّى تَسْتَأْنِسُوا وَتُسَلِّمُوا عَلَىٰ أَهْلِهَا 
ذَلِكُمْ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَذَكَّرُونَ O oh, you who believe, do not enter homes that are not yours until you make yourselves known, until you make your presence felt. You would actually knock to receive or achieve that permission to enter before you entered. Allah says, that is better for you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. The next verse, Allah says, if there is no one in that house, it's not your house, don't enter the house. And guess what? Allah says, if you are told to go back, go back, it's better for you. Allahu Akbar. Imagine you go to someone's house, your friend's house, you knock on the door, they don't answer. You knock on the door again, they still don't answer. And then they tell you, please go back, come back later, another time. Nearly all of us would actually feel so bad, we might never go back to that house. Do you agree? We would feel bad. But Allah says it is the right of that person to tell you, you've come to my house at the wrong time. I'm busy doing something you are going to disturb. What is the point of going to someone's house while they were busy? They are now entertaining you and they've left what they were doing. And as a result, they are waiting for you to go. I'd rather go when they want me to sit. When you visit people, my brothers and my sisters, or should I say my sisters and my brothers, when you visit people, you need to know when to go and how long to sit for. Allahu Akbar. You don't just go and park there all night and all day until people start giving you 20 different signs that they really need to go and you're still sitting. No, you need to know when you go for a short period of time, you would be loved. I'd rather people think this man came for five minutes. Let him come again. Oh Allah, bring him back. Then the next time if they see me and they were to say, no way, not that guy again. He's going to sit here for two hours. Astaghfirullah. May Allah forgive us. So Allah is telling us these rules in the Quran because they are extremely important. We take them for granted. I remember when I was young, I visited with my mom a certain house. Some of you might know the story. And we saw a sticker on the door. And my mom, she, was, she didn't read English actually. So we told her that, you know what it says on the, on the sticker here? It says, we are very happy at your arrival, but we will be even happier when you depart. Allahu Akbar. My brothers and sisters, she never went back to that house. <laughs> Although we tried to explain to her, it was just a joke. Don't joke about things that would hurt people. Imagine someone telling you, welcome, welcome. But when you go, oh, I'm going to have a party. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. My brothers and sisters, the moral of it is you need to know when to go. You need to announce. You need to seek permission. You need to make sure. Today we have the mobile phone. Mashallah. Phone them. Message them. Ask for permission. What are you guys doing this Sunday? And please, when they tell you we're going out for a picnic, don't say we're joining. No, not at all. No way. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Give them their private time. Give them their time. We want to avoid tension in the ummah. We want to avoid hatred amongst ourselves as families and so on. So consider the others, give them their space, visit them short period of time. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease and goodness. You know, nowadays just as well, many people are on a diet. So when they visit you, they tell you, look, I'm not going to be having anything. The tea that you're offering me, I don't want it. Subhanallah. I'd, I'd rather just do with a little bit of water. And they really mean it because there was a time when people used to come and they park until the samosas are out then they know now we're welcome may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease so my brothers and sisters don't go there to expect something go for the love of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the relationship that you have you want to go in order to develop the beautiful relationship this is what it is all about and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells that to us in a beautiful way i want to go back a few verses you know the accusation against Aisha radiallahu anha, who was the daughter of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anha, as well as the, the wife of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the mother of the believers radiallahu anha. At that time, there was a man who was spreading this rumor and he was a relative of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anha. He was a poor man. His name was Mistah ibn Athatha radiallahu anha. And at the same time, he was poor. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anha used to spend on him. He was related to them. He was a muhajir. He had made hijrah. So when the rumor was spread by him as well, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu said, Wallahi, I'm never going to spend on this man again. How could he do this? You know, a lot of us, you do good to someone. And when you hear that that particular person is spreading rumor about you, the minimum is you say, right, I'm cutting it. I don't need all this. 
But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu anhu regarding something beautiful. And Allah says, those who are, those who are of virtue, those who have been given virtue from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who've been given sustenance, those who have been given something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and those who are granted a high rank by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's known as al-fadl. Fadl is the virtue of Allah. It includes so many different aspects of life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they should not be swearing an oath that they're not going to spend on someone who is a relative, who is poor, a person who has made hijrah, etc. Allah says, forgive and embrace. Wouldn't you like Allah to forgive you? For indeed, Allah is most forgiving, most merciful. Verse number 22 and the verse after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلْيَعْفُوا وَلْيَصْفَحُوا أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَّحِيمٌ You should forgive and you should embrace. Wouldn't you like Allah to forgive you as a result of you having forgiven someone else? For indeed Allah is most forgiving, most merciful. Brothers and sisters, these are the days of forgiveness. We know that. Can you find it in your heart to forgive those who have wronged you? Can you find it in your heart to forgive your relatives? Can you find it in your heart to forgive those who have perhaps done something against you, your family members, your friends, etc.? If you can, you need to know there is a far greater chance that Allah will then forgive you. These are the verses. Verse number 22, 23 of Surah An-Nur. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. Many of us, we think to ourselves, no, I won't forgive them, but I know I will get the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Try it. You don't have to associate with them every day. Sometimes someone has wronged you and they have wronged you in a very bad way. Forgiveness does not mean you now need to go and park with them. Sorry for using that word so many times tonight. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. But what I mean is you don't have to go and sit with them for so long. You don't have to go and interact with them in such an intimate way to say, oh, to prove that I've forgiven you. No, you have forgiven them from here. Salamu alaykum wa alaykum as salam. There is nothing wrong in not wanting to have more than that to do with them. No problem, but you've forgiven them. Don't mix the two. One is to hold it in your heart. So you have nothing to do with them and you are so angry all the time and you have a burden on your shoulder. The other is to say, Oh Allah, I make you bear witness that I've forgiven this person. I will greet them. They will greet me back, but I don't want to have much to do with them thereafter because I don't want to be bitten again. Nothing wrong with that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. So I was mentioning this because it's important for us to learn that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu was being guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that guidance is for us all. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of an absolutely important point. Today we speak about hijab and people say, MashaAllah, you know how important hijab is across the globe. The hijab is being fought in some places where they want to ban it and they have banned it in some places. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to us about hijab in Surah An-Nur. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off by speaking about lowering the gaze. And can I surprise you? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs first the males to lower their gaze and then the females. After that, the next verse speaks about the females. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, verse number 30 of Surah An-Nur, قُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَغُضُّوا مِنْ أَبَصَارِهِمْ وَيَحْفَظُوا فُرُوجَهُمْ Tell the believing males to lower their gazes and to protect their private parts, protect their morality. Subhanallah, many men think the rules are only for the women, right? So the men, they say we can stay. And because they heard that, you know, the first look is okay. So you find, you know, from the right corner all the way to the left, the brother is staring. Wow. And his eyes are so open, you know, Subhanallah. And if you tell him, hey, what are you doing? He says, hey, leave me. It's still the first one. It's still the first one. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. That's not what it is. The first one here refers to a glimpse that might have fallen as a result of you trying to look where you were walking or what you were doing, etc. So you happen to look and then you look down. That is called the first one. The first one is not when you follow it up with a complete solid look that follows it through. A'udhu Billah. Allah tells you here, hey, tell the believing males to lower their gazes. 
and to protect their morality, chastity, and at the same time, protect their private parts. It's very clear. These are the words used in the Quran. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us protect ourselves. Then Allah says, Same instruction. After that, to the females, let them lower their gazes and protect their private parts and let them not expose their beauty. Let them not expose their beauty. Whatever you consider beautiful from your body, learn to cover it. Allahu Akbar. Go and say that sentence 10 times and then look at yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, when Allah says, cover your beauty, what is beautiful? Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. That's Allah. He says, cover your beauty. People argue and fight. So I tell them, perhaps maybe you have uncovered something because it doesn't fall in this category. I need not say anymore. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. My brothers and sisters, let's understand. This is the rule of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The problem with us, and I'm going to say it as it is, we tend in our homes to dress up when we are going out, when we are going to see others, not realizing the man in this house is supposed to be the one that we dress for. The one that we try to attract in such a way that he looks at us and he's like, Subhanallah, oh Allah, I thank you for what you've blessed me with. Subhanallah. But the difficulty is we will dress, you know, to the T, Subhanallah, as we're leaving the home. So when husband comes back, you know what happens? <laughs> we're busy smelling of food, onions, fries, etc. I remember once when I made mention of this, someone sent me an email saying, well, what should I do if my husband likes the food with onions and the fries and so on and so forth? I have a choice. Either I dress up and he brings a cook to cook the food or either I cook and he has to make do with how he sees me. May Allah forgive us. But my brothers, I have a very important point that we take for granted. Did you know you too are supposed to dress up for your spouse? Many people speak about how important it is for the wife to dress up for the husband. Nobody speaks about how important it is to look smart when you go home. Mashallah. Look smart. You know, you wear all beautiful clothing when you're going out. You're guilty as well. So let's stop, you know, only telling the women. We need to be told as well. The wife looks at you and you know, you're looking scruffy and fluffy. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. But at the same time, you need to be a person who looks such that when your wife looks at you, she appreciates too the gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon her. So my brothers and sisters, after these verses of lowering the gaze and covering the beauty and protecting chastity, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ends by saying, in order for you to achieve success, repent all of you believers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that you will be successful. You want success? Keep repenting to Allah. Ask Allah's forgiveness. That is the way forward. Remember what I've told you this evening. If you were to adopt the goodness in it, you would definitely save yourselves and your family members and the environment that you live in from a lot of tension, a lot of problem, a lot of sin as well. Imagine there are some people who don't like to leave the home because they are so happy with what they have inside the home. That's why the hadith says, the hadith speaks of an najat, najat meaning success. And the Prophet ﷺ asked his companions, do you know what is success? He mentioned three things. He says, amlik lisanak, control your tongue. Wal yasa'ka baytuk. And your house, your home should be spacious enough for you that you don't need to leave it unnecessarily. Stay at home. That's the second thing. Third thing, ibki ala khati'atik. Cry, cry when you've committed a sin. Cry over it. Repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So my brothers and sisters, these are beautiful words of advice. Absolutely amazing. I quickly want to make mention that tomorrow evening we will be having the final of these episodes in the month of Ramadan. And at the same time, I will not be completing the entire Quran because the idea is to draw lessons from it, but we will complete it in episodes to follow thereafter beyond the month of Ramadan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all goodness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all success. May He grant
grant us forgiveness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us through our problems and issues. Remember when you are suffering, go back to diagnose the reasons by looking at whom you have wronged, what you have said about people, seek forgiveness, ask Allah to forgive you and ask them to forgive you and you will find your doors opening. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open all our doors of goodness. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruk wa natubu ilayk.